Manager for Waste Management and the Environment with Warwickshire County Council. And um, I'm very happy to be talking to you tonight uh, with uh, ably assisted by a number of, uh, of people about our Green Shoots Community Fund. Um, and this is our, our Meet the Funder event. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to ask for the presentation to be put up now, which means that you won't be able to see me or see me so well. And whilst that's coming onto the screen, I should say that we are recording this presentation. So people who have missed it or want to see it again can actually watch it back later. So we will be recording this and putting it on our website and we'll be sending the slides and the a link to the recording to everyone who's attended and probably quite a few other people as well who, who are interested in, uh, in green shoots. So thank you, Rhiannon, for that first slide. That's what we're doing here. Let's go to the next slide. So just a couple of points of, of housekeeping. I, I think most of us will be quite um, familiar with webinars now. So if you could please keep your microphones muted during the presentations. Um, if you have any questions, then there'll be a question and answer session at the end of the presentations. But if you want to flag or do you, if you want to flag questions to us on the way through, then please type them in the chat and we will be taking questions from the chat uh, at the end of the, uh, the presentations as well. The event will be recorded, which I've said already, and slide will be shared with you after the session, which I've said already as well. Next slide. So what are we covering, covering today? Well, this is all about um, the Green Shoots, which is our, our community fund. We'll be talking about the context and progress to date, eligibility and purpose, assessment criteria, timetable and deadlines, which are, are approaching relatively quickly. Still plenty of time, but uh, I'm sure the time will go very quickly. Support available to you and how to contact us as well. Next slide, Rhiannon. Right, I'm going to be handing over to Matt in a second, who will take you through the detail of the uh, the scheme. What I wanted to do is just spend a couple of minutes just to talk about the County Council's commitment to climate change. So the County Council is one of a number of authorities that's declared a climate emergency, and we're putting in place plans and um, and strategies to actually combat climate change. And that's not only across our estate, so the carbon footprint the County Council emits, but also across the whole of Warwickshire. Um, I've got a slide in front of you which I wanted to put up. It just talks a bit about some of the areas we're concentrating on and our commitments. And the so, document to the left is our council. I can't hear. The microphone doesn't work. Um, I can hear somebody saying they can't hear what we're saying. Can you hear us now? I'm going to bash ahead. I, we are recording the session, so if people have got IT issues, and sadly some of us do, um, then people can. And that's a message just coming through to say that people can hear OK, so hopefully most of you can hear OK and others can play this back later on. But the document on the left hand side of this slide is the Council's Council plan that's freely available on the County Council's website, and that actually enshrines, if you like, our um, our commitment to climate change as well. And climate change is one of our three top priorities in that plan. Right, next slide. Um, this is a slide where I'm trying to show you the how we're decarbonising our own estate. So the big blue um, circle on the left hand side is our carbon emissions back in 11, uh, sorry, 2019-20. And that basically is the um, including the scope because we need to be careful about scopes when we talk about carbon emissions, but that scope includes our buildings, our fleets and our staff business travel, but doesn't include everything that we want to include in the future. But what this slide shows you is we've actually made some very good progress already in decarbonizing our own estates, and reducing our own carbon emissions, and we've actually reduced them by about 31% in the time period shown. And next slide. But what I wanted to do is make people aware of the scale of the challenge that we're facing. So what we've got here is a uh, just a pie chart that talks about the total of carbon emissions emitted by Warwickshire. So that's all the all the people in Warwickshire, all the businesses in Warwickshire transport that um, goes on in Warwickshire. And what we're saying here is there are actually 5.1 million tonnes of carbon emitted every year. And that's actually quite a sizable reduction on where it was about three to five years ago as well. Um, 
public sector, so that's, that's our own carbon emissions and the carbon emissions of the public sector, are only a small percentage of that, about 2%. The vast majority of the carbon emissions, uh, as you can see from the pie, pie chart, are emitted from transport. So that's all transport within the county, uh, but that's mainly road transport, um, but also from domestic properties, that's about 17%, and industry, which is about 31%. So the scale of the challenge is actually very big. Uh, and that's why we think that everybody in Warwickshire, um, everyone who works or lives or visits Warwickshire has a role to play in reducing our carbon emissions. And the other figure I wanted to point out is that um, according to the Local Government Association, our ability to influence carbon emissions is limited to about 31% of all carbon emissions within the county. So that's why I'm saying this is going to be a joint effort by a large number of people, well everybody, and a lot of different bodies. I think that's my last slide, Rhiannon, so if you go on to the next slide, then I will hand over to Matt. He'll take you uh, through some of the detail of Green Shoots. Thank you, Andrew, and um, hello, everyone. I'm Matt Whitehead. I'm the Climate Change Programme Manager here at Warwickshire County Council. Um, so in this section, I want to rewind a little bit and talk about phase one of Green Shoots. Then I go on to talk about this phase. So the whole idea about the scheme is that it's intended to fund local projects related to climate change aligned to our council's priority for being a council with sustainable future. This means adapting, mitigating to climate change and meeting net zero commitments. So we established a Green Shoots Fund in 2021. We've got a £1 million pot to distribute and it's intended to fund local projects, as I say, related to climate change. So we've funded 69 projects so far. Um, and some of the case studies were available um, through the link that you see on the screen. So Green Shoots um, Phase 2 opened in June 2022, and that's there to award the remaining £335,000. So the aims and principles of the scheme do remain the same, but there's one key difference in that in Phase 2, we hope to address the imbalance of funds um, allocated across the county. So in terms of eligibility, eligibility and purpose, um, eligible organisations, as with phase one, are not-for-profit and community voluntary organisations in Warwickshire, schools, but if there's applying as a PTA or as a friends of group, but that does include fee-paying schools, exclude, sorry, fee-paying schools, town and parish councils, and Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council as a proxy for town and parish councils which don't exist in the county, in the borough. So the sorts of projects that we're looking to fund are those that fit into the category of carbon reduction emissions, um, increasing the resilience of assets or areas to climate change, delivering environmental benefits. And one area that's very critical for us is in community benefits. OK, so we're aiming to benefit the whole of Warwickshire through the scheme. So in the first round, the majority of funding was allocated to Stratford and to Warwick, with rugby on a per population basis not too far behind. With phase two, we're looking to rebalance this so that each area receives a similar level of funding per capita from the whole £1 million fund. Therefore, whilst funding is available for all areas, we're especially keen to get applications from those based in Nuneaton and Bedworth and those from the North Warwickshire area. Equally, though, we would encourage projects that work with or benefit residents in underrepresented areas, um, but these projects don't need to be run from an organisation in those areas. Indeed, it can be managed from any area but ideally from those in Warwickshire. But you might have a project in mind that provides county-wide benefits. So that might provide um, benefits to a mix of locations. So in those cases, we'd like to think about how to maximise those benefits to the north. We'll try and make this programme as easy to apply as possible and have refined the system since phase one. We we'll hope you'll take the opportunity that this funding presents 
In terms of the initial guidance, I'll talk to you about what we've been looking for. So phase two criteria, in simple terms, we're looking for sound deliverable projects that are good for climate change and community benefits that ideally outlast the life of the project. You hear about some very good examples in the next slot delivered by Ruth. Um, but looking at some of the initial areas, there are some gateway or hurdle questions that need to be satisfied first to qualify. Does the project meet those green shoots objectives? Are they, um, is it a benefit to Warwickshire as a whole? Um, does it come from constituted groups um, or from um, parent teacher associations or from friends of schools groups? Or perhaps it comes from a town and parish council or from Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council. There's something also about subsidy control rules. Um, now, it's not going to affect many of you, but it relates to a threshold of grant support received from all sources over the last three years. So I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but we're happy to help you on a case per case basis as you begin to develop your application. So next, I'm going to provide a short overview of the criteria that we'll be assessing projects against, starting with cost effective environmental benefits. So simply, we're looking here to see is the project good value for money? So in your answers on climate change and environmental benefits, you'll need to integrate how, the, how it will benefit the relevant geographical area. We're looking to understand the nature and the benefit of the impact of the project and how this will change as a result. How will you know it's been a successful project? And also, why do you and your community consider this necessary? And is the grant needed to make this happen or accelerate this? In terms of costs, we're, part, we're happy to part fund projects either when the additional money comes from the group or from another grant source. But please be clear um, what, what part is then to be funded by green shoots. So as far as possible, please specify this. We're happy to discuss this with you. If you're submitting an application that provides benefits to a mix of locations, it would also be helpful if you could identify the costs that provide the benefit to targeted underrepresented areas in the north. So officers with a high level of expertise in that type of project will be assessing the application and also they'll refer to similar projects in the in this phase and in the last to, uh, to come to their conclusion. But do bear in mind this is a competitive process. So the second criteria is around about community benefits. And as I said, this is quite a critical area for us. So we need to understand how it will benefit the local community. We want to understand the extent of those benefits. Um, one area we're looking to see are volunteers involved, for example. Um, has there been community engagement? Within that, you might want to seek um, the support of the local councillor. Is it a project that's free to access? Um, and um, are, are there obvious restrictions on residents or communities accessing the benefits? So for example, is it in a, a locked off or gated area? So as in the environmental section, we're looking to understand how communities in underrepresented or socially deprived areas will benefit. So in terms of criteria three, we're looking at deliverables. We need to be confident that the proposed project can actually be delivered. Clearly, not all projects will be managed in the same way, but the larger the project, the greater focus here is needed and the greater detail needs to be included. We need to hear about team experience. We need to be looking at a delivery and time plan. Within that, dependencies on key tasks. We need to be looking at risks and mitigation steps. And can the project be executed with the budget? All of these need to be included and all these need to be thought about in advance. Are you looking to, to, uh, to put into place a realistic and appropriate time scale? Um, we, we know things change, um, so we just need you though to think about this and to put your best estimate in place. Permissions are particularly key for us. 
Some solar projects, for example, and heat pump projects may need permissions from the distribution net network operator who are Western Power in this area. Some tree planting projects may need landowner permissions, whilst others may be subject to planning review. Do consider all these ahead of time. Next slide. So in terms of legacy value and potential for replication, this is important because we want to see um, that this will last over time. So good maintenance is part of that. We need to we need to ensure that projects are delivered, um, that the projects that are delivered do um, perform over the long term. This might relate to the maintenance of a, a heating system, and we need to know that that's costed in and resourced in the project. If not, what provision is there for it? Once complete, the operator needs to get the best out of it. Do users know how to operate the electric vehicle charging point, for example? And another area that's particularly key is around about showcasing and replication. We can help with case studies. Um, what we would like is the project to be socialized. We would like the project, where possible, um, to be used elsewhere in the county or even, even outside the county. So the next area, um, we're looking at a plan to resource and assess post-project benefits. So you have stated the project impacts in the question about environmental and community benefits. We want to understand how these will be monitored. We want to be informed on how the project's progressing and information on monitoring where this, where this is happening is helpful. This is not in any way bureaucratic, but we need to keep up the dialogue with you. We may, may be able to help if there are indeed problems. At the end of the project, we'd like to be able to assess if the project has met your original expectations. Here, you'd look at the original statement for success measures and compare them to what you've achieved. You might have planted 50 trees or installed a 50 kilowatt solar panel or developed um, an awareness campaign. The post-project evaluation, well, that's a little bit different in that you'll be able to assess benefits after the project has been operating for a while. You might be looking at how many trees are still alive after a year, how much electricity has been generated from that solar panel. You might have carried out a survey to determine awareness levels that you can report on. Now, don't worry if you're not, not getting um, those sort of levels um, that you, you first expected. We're not going to penalise you. We're not going to take away the money, um, but we do need to understand that. It's all about lessons learned here. It's important that we, that we know that you've thought about this in advance and have built in the capacity to capture this information. So in terms of the timeline for the scheme, we've opened the doors on the 17th of June. The deadline is coming up. It's on the 19th of September. We're targeting the award of grants um, in mid-November. And after that, um, you've got two weeks then to return the grant offer letter. Under normal circumstances, we'll pay the grant on proof of completion of the project, aiming to pay um, so, um, once, you've, once we've seen that, that proof. But that will put you in the position of having um, um, the grant once you've once once before you've paid the majority of your costs. OK, now Ruth's going to talk about some of the projects we funded in phase one. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you, Matt. Uh, my name is Ruth Dixon and I work. My day job is in uh, waste management. Um, but I've also been administering uh, in phase one of Green Shoots uh, the payments to the projects and uh, answering questions of projects that have been successful and uh, are in progress. Um, so we had 69 projects that were successful in phase one, uh, a range of different types of uh, community group and a range of different types of projects. Um, half the projects were of low value, which we count as less than five thousand uh, pounds and the other half uh, valued between five thousand and twenty five thousand uh, pounds and we spent uh, about six hundred and twenty five thousand pounds in total and we've got um, some more left uh, for this second phase. 
so uh, just to uh, recap what uh, Matt said, the projects should include in these projects that I'm going to showcase as case studies certainly demonstrated good levels of environmental benefit as well as good community benefit and being accessible to a big broad range of community uh, members. Um, they obviously demonstrate carbon reduction and um, in a couple of cases they also demonstrated adaptation to a changing climate and uh, working in uh, maybe hotter, drier summers and uh, warmer and wetter winters. Next slide please. Um, so here's some pictures from some biodiversity type um, projects. Um, and it's just to demonstrate really that each project has had a lot of people involved. It's tried to draw in um, families and children from the community uh, and get maximum benefit from both the activity of improving the biodiversity and the improved uh, space as well. So the, the top one is um, from Farnborough and this is an example of a community planting day where they uh, bought some trees and prepared the ground with the funding and then invited people from the community to come and spend a day uh, planting trees and just getting to know each other as well. Um, the centre one is a town centre uh, um, project which is based in Rugby. They've made these um, planters uh, in which they are planted at herbs and um, so the community's got together to, to um, select what plants should go in and um, make the beds and do the planting. Uh, and then there's a, po a poster um, notice board and that says invites anybody who's passing to help themselves to any of the herbs that they want and use in their own cooking. So it's encouraging people to grow their own and see that it's fairly straightforward to grow your own in a lot of cases. Um, and it's, yeah, just a freely accessible community space. Um, top right is in uh, Shuttington in uh, North Warwickshire area and they have improved this uh, open green space um, to turn it from just a big bit of grass into wildflower meadow uh, with a pond and some other facilities and information about uh, what they're trying to do and really enhance uh, the range of different uh, plants and animals that are living in that corner of the village. Um, and the bottom picture with the children in, that's called a children's forest. It's based at Liso Farm. Um, and they, all of the trees that they're planting there are planted by the children and they spend a whole day learning about why what they're doing is important and how looking after trees uh, for their future uh, is, a, is a really important thing to do. So we've had applications, uh, successful applications from rural locations, um, recreation grounds, uh, in-town uh, locations, um, including wildflower um, meadows, tree planting, hedge planting. Um, successful applicants have been from churches, a couple of schools, although I will say that the schools need to be able to um, demonstrate that there, there's community access and not just by the specific school community, which is a bit of a challenge to achieve in a, in a primary school at least. Um, there's been um, um, they're looking into building vertical green spaces, what they call living walls um, at some hospitals, and that's going well. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, here's some examples of where um, biodiversity projects have been. Um, the word about them has been spread using some local promotion and we can assist with that and our social media um, avenues in the County Council. Um, so this was um, Priory Park in Warwick where they planted some trees and had a specific day where, day where they invited people to come over and they had uh, the Lord Lieutenant come to uh, have his picture taken and do a bit of digging himself. Um, and then in the next slide please, uh, Rhiannon, this is a project in the Neaton Inner Church uh, garden. Again, a big bit of grass that they've turned into something a lot more special uh, and they've had a number of different open days across um the summer and there's the last one's coming up on the 17th of September if you're local you could uh, go and have a look at that but this is a sort of thing that we're hoping that a project will do we'll do some great work and then we'll tell people about it and get a wider range of the community uh, involved brilliant thank you so uh, next slide please moving on to um, energy if uh, renewable energy type projects. So these have all been uh, solar PV, although there would be scope also for solar thermal projects, possibly a windmill, possibly uh, heat pumps. It, it very much depends on your situation. Um, so we've had some 
put on schools, community centres and churches. And this particular example is St George's Church in Rugby. Um, so there's some information in our case studies. This church has got some good information on their web page and we can seek to put you in touch with um, similar projects if you've got ideas uh, and you just need a bit of help uh, bringing them to uh, a proper project plan. Uh, yes, thanks. Next slide, please, Rhiannon. Here we've got uh, some pictures taken from some energy efficiency type projects. Um, so we've had street lighting put in place in a few different parish councils uh, and um, that's been very successful. So changing the bulbs to LED, more efficient light bulbs. Uh, and on the left hand side, this is a Kingsbury Community and Youth Centre where they've had all replacement windows. This is following uh, um, a methodology that we like to encourage, which is called Fabric First, where you try and improve the insulation of the roof, walls, ceiling, windows, draft proofing before you think about uh, a different way to heat or power uh, the building. So this should have some good long term improvements in uh, insulation and also probably sound insulation as well. Um, yes, yeah, thanks. Um, so here's a couple of examples of transport related projects. So we've had a few projects who've put uh, electric charging points in their local area at Might and Hospice uh, charity and also a couple of village halls. We've also had a cycle path built and some bike racks. Um, so if you're interested in following this example from Stratton on Foss and putting some uh, EV charging in your local area, again, we can put you in touch with a couple of successful projects to give you a bit, a few more pointers. Uh, and then on the right hand side, this is a project that would be interested, I think, interesting and think for all of us. It's called Cycle Bodies and whether you're an experienced cyclist and you can offer your expertise to help a novice or whether you're uh, new to cycling and you'd like a bit of um, assistance, suggestions on how to maintain your bike, what route is best for you to take and just techniques for being safe on the road or on your route. Um, this is a brilliant project that couples up experienced cyclists with novices and gives them um, a helping hand and some extra confidence. Uh, we'd really like to see this expand into Nuneaton and Bedworth and North Warwickshire. So if you think that you could assist with that, uh, do let, let us know. Next slide, please, Rhiannon. Then. Uh, waste reduction. So this is uh, close to our hearts. Um, and we've had funding for a repair cafe. Again, we'd really like there to be a bigger network of repair cafe and for those to extend a bit more into Nuneaton and Bedworth or North Warwickshire. Um, and uh, we've also had some uh, money given for some water harvesting at some allotments and also uh, some extra composting and water butts given out in um, me on Vale, where they didn't just give them away. In order to get one, you had to uh, listen to them uh, tell you some very interesting things about how to do better at composting before you uh, got your compost bin. Um, other projects that I've not highlighted in the documentation, uh, an organisation developed a set of newsletters in Napton and delivered them around to all the local area, um, talking about various aspects of environmental sustainability. Uh, we've funded some training and some school awareness days, um, a school climate change day, uh, and we'd love to hear from projects that were more about adaptation and uh, coping with the changing climate. Um, I think that may be my last slide of pictures, Rhiannon, and I'm, I'm not sure what's next. Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, Michelle's turn. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I'm Michelle um, Black from um, Warwickshire Community and Voluntary Action. I'm the Funding and Groups Development Officer for Nuneaton and Bedsworth. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of what Warwickshire Carver is, um, we're the local infrastructure organisation for Warwickshire and Solihull. So we provide vital support to groups and volunteers um, working to strengthen all of our communities across the region. So we do this by offering um, support with um, set up with new groups and um, governance around setting up um, constitutions and policies all the way through to the funding stage, identifying funding and applying for funding. And then we also do the volunteering side, the recruitment, the good practice, and then working with people that want to volunteer to find that um, suitable opportunity. Um, so Warwickshire Carver can help you with your um, application. 
Um, we can do this um, by reviewing and supporting you to write the necessary supporting documents, as was mentioned, the constitution. And we have a resource library on our um, website and we can provide you with a template constitution. And then we can give you some um, ideas and pointers of what to put in that and um, come up with your aims and, and what your group wants to do. So that's if you're starting off um, from scratch, really. Um, once you've done your application, you can send it into um, one of the funding and groups development officers. They can proofread it, check it. Um, usually we can like put notes on the side of it and then send it back to you to um, amend. Um, we can clarify some of the questions in the application form if you're not sure. I know some of them have mentioned, um, like it could be that you're struggling to find how you're gonna um, work with the wider community, how you're gonna involve volunteers, um, how you're gonna evaluate project. We can go through all that and give you some suggestions and point you in the right direction to answer those questions. We can also assist with technical difficulties. So if you've got any problems with um, accessing the application form, um, we can answer other questions. Um, if, it's, if you've got problems emailing it in and different things like that, we, we can help you with that bit as well. Um, if you want, you can meet with us further. So you can have a one-to-one -one meeting with the funding and groups um, development officer in your area. Um, for example, I would meet up with a group or we can do it online um, and then we can just go through um, your project idea and all the questions again and, and support you to get that application filled out. And then um, we can also support with identifying and applying to other funders if um, this one isn't suitable or um, you need extra funding. Um, we can also um, identify other funders and, and go through applications with that as well. We've got another slide. So overall, we've got Tracy Salvum, who's the area manager for the mid um, Warwickshire area. She will answer any general inquiries about the applications to Green Shoots. In North Warwickshire, we've got David Simpkins, myself from the Neaton and Bedworth in Rugby. We've got Phoebe Hilton, Warwick District, we've got Fiona. And then in Stratford, um, we've got Chris. Um, so all the emails and phone numbers are on that slide. Um, you can go to our website for further information. It is um, wcarver.org.uk and all the details are on there um, of how to contact us. Um, as a, the deadline is approaching, I would say to um, make contact with one of us um, if, if you need to, um, as soon as you can. And if you do want to meet in a one-to-one -one session, please book that in as soon as you can, because you know the application it, it takes time to go through it put it together and and it is um only a few weeks away till the 19th so um and we are part-time workers as well um so please do get in touch and and use the support that's on offer from Warwickshire Carver to get your applications in I think that's it for me Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to all the speakers. So um, for more information, there's our own email address, which is greenshoots at warwickshire.gov.uk. As um, Michelle mentioned, the main contact at Carver is Tracy, and then that's the link to our website. So I'll just leave that up for a few minutes while we start looking over the questions now. So the first one is um, one for Ruth, I think. And um, someone is asking about a small an organisation has a small membership fee and whether they can apply. They also offer free membership to those on low incomes and community groups. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, th we think that that's uh, entirely possible. So long as you meet the eligibility criteria, and that means you need to be a not-for-profit -for organisation, so not a business, um, if there's a membership fee f for for good reason, like, for example, if you are a scout group, you would charge a membership fee to cover insurance and badges and stuff like that, but it's obviously a not-for-profit organisation, and that's exactly the sort of um, community group that we would be encouraging to um, bid. So, yeah, if... It doesn't matter that you're charging membership fees so long as you fulfil the other criteria. Okay. And Janet, that question was from you and you had your hand up. Was there a follow up question you had? No, no, that was the question I wanted answered. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks. And the next um, question. Oh. OK, um, Andrew, if you could take the next question, please, which is about um, how the f um, receiving the grants works and whether we have the um, people who apply have to pay in advance of receiving their grant. Yes, thank you, Rhiannon. Um, I mean, we're, we're a county council and we're dealing with public money, so it's very careful. Uh, we have to be very careful about how we spend that money, how we grant that money. So our preferred option is for the project to be completed evidence to be provided and then we'll pay the grant on provision of that evidence. However, we know from round one that that doesn't suit all projects and sometimes, you know, 
um, projects aren't actually asking for that much money. And from the application and from the organisation we're dealing with, we can see that they appear to be very reputable. So under the round one of Green Shoots, we have actually paid for some projects up front. And we've also uh, entered into arrangements for staged payments where part of the project's carried out and then we'll pay part of the grant money and then the next part is carried out and then we'll pay the next part of the grant money. We do want to keep things as simple as possible and we do think uh, want to keep our money accessible. This is grant money that we're giving to community groups for good work and we want to we want this money placed in the community, invested in communities so that work can go ahead. So we're committed to working with community groups to make sure that can happen. Thank you. Andrew. I um, hope that answers the question, but if there's any follow up question to that, then I'm happy to take that as well. And um, the chairman of Weddington Primary PTA has asked a similar question, which is we don't have large funds to draw on, but is there any mechanism for smoothing the money flow? I think you've mostly covered that already in your answer, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I mean, it, what we saw um, with round one as well is that some of the projects were um, buying things which they didn't have to pay for up front. So we could actually receive invoices as, a, as evidence and then pay the grant money. And we, we are a public body, we can actually pay things quite quickly uh, as long as we've got the right evidence. So in some instances, people were actually receiving invoices for, say, trees which they wanted to plant. We were then receiving the invoices and actually paying the grant money on, on that basis. And that actually seemed to work, work very well. So I'm sure that if the project's good and we want to support it, we'll find a way of actually trying to help that project succeed. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Ruth, the next one for you, if that's OK. Um, it was mentioned that community access provided, proved challenging for primary schools. If any of the primary schools received funds in phase one, could you advise on how they demonstrated how the community access was achieved? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, one of the projects in Race Lee School in the Neaton and Bedworth, um, part of what they were doing was to install a wildlife camera which is then uh, fed to a feed on on their internet pages so having stuff on the web it doesn't need to be necessarily live feed but just information updates on the web about what you're doing that the community can look at um, most schools would send out a newsletter or an e-newsletter so some information in there on a regular basis about what the funding was paying for and how the children and the wider community were benefiting from the funding. Um, and then sometimes schools have an open day or similar where um, people can come and visit. Um, some schools have put in place uh, facilities that can be shared with others in addition to the school, so hired out or maybe um, sort of forest school facilities that a local nursery or a local uh, guide group or similar could access. So there's certainly ways of making it so that you're project is an exclusive for the exclusive use of just the children but we'd need you to really spell it out to us and tell us how it was helping how it was building potentially capacity so uh, if um, PTA members or school staff members were learning skills new skills in uh, green project management or uh, a new understanding of um, tree planting or meadow management or similar that sort of extra capacity that's been installed into that community group would be useful. So yeah, I, I guess we're asking you to sell it, sell it to us if it's the case, and understandably in a primary school, that the gates are shut during the school day and only the children and teachers have got access to the facility that we've paid for. Okay, and Michelle, I think this one might be for you. Um, looking to figure out priorities to improve the fabric of our community centre, trying to find someone who could do an energy survey and funding it. Is the help available to find a suitable supplier? Is that something that Carver could advise on? Or you're on mute still. There we go. Um, no, unfortunately, we can't do um, sort of help with um sort of people in in sort of expertise areas around energy suppliers i don't know if there's anyone in the county oh, council matt. that could do that matt's got his hand up thank you matt yeah this is a similar question to one we had in the in the first webinar we held um so whilst we can't directly advise on a supplier um there, there were these sorts of projects that have been done in the first phase so what we could do is put you in touch with um, some of those um, projects uh, from the first phase and see if they could advise um, on a suitable supplier. So if you provide your details, Ian, we could, we could perhaps go and do that. Okay, thank you, Matt. That's the last of the questions, unless anyone else has anything that they'd like to raise. 
put you put your hand up. Oh, Ruth, you've got your hand up. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to add to what Matt said that really for the, this particular pot of funding, we're looking for projects that are ready to go in a physical sense, so ready to produce something on the ground. Um, and this isn't really the part of funding for feasibility studies or an assessment of what type of uh, energy improvements could be made in a building. Um, so yeah, there might there might be other funding out there, and Michelle might know of other funding that would pay for that sort of thing. But this is more for we want you to be ready to install a new heating system or put in a new set of windows or similar. Thank you, um, Peter Everett. You got your hand up? Yes. So uh, so our project is is largely about um, that sort of biodiversity and and sort of putting in structures. It, it is based within a school, um, but it's, it's putting in structures that are going to be used by the community and by the by the school and accessible for the SEN children and other things. So it's quite a quite a wide ranging uh, scope in terms of who it's going to touch. Um, but our expectation is that those things that we're going to put in place because they're made out of natural materials and other things um, uh, are probably going to be sort of maintenance free for 15 or 20 years. Is that the sort of thing that you would consider to be value for money if 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 we're if, if we're looking at putting things in that are, are, are going to be non-maintained in a natural environment, supporting biodiversity, etc. Um, rather than looking at things like solar panels, etc. This is really about looking at the, the natural world rather than uh, looking at how we can sort of generate power and things like that. Rhiannon, I'm happy to. Yeah. Thank you. OK, um, thank you for that question. Um, I, th I think we need to relate back to the aims and objectives of the Green Shoots Fund, which is all about community activity and addressing the impacts of climate change, um, adaptation, mitigation, those sorts of things. I think what you're talking about is a project here that will then hopefully meet some of those objectives and perhaps inspire people to actually take action. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we, yeah we, we, we certainly want to then bring that in, we want to bring that into the, the school environment so that the children learn about biodiversity as part of the project so that the, the children are the children form part of the core of the project in its delivery and that the children are learning about that biodiversity but also the things that we're installing within the school that will be then used by the wider community um, uh, we also then bring the wider community into understanding that and how the, the children then translate that back to the wider community, et cetera. That, that's, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad that you've got the point about the project being more publicly accessible than just being confined to a school. Um, just a word of caution, when you talk about building something or structures, um, we do look at what we're trying to achieve and then the value of the project. And in round one, we saw a number of applications to do structural work, building, put in new structures, which we questioned the value over. So, you know, e everything we fund has got to meet the aims and objectives of green shoots. And we aren't necessarily, um, you know, stepping forward to fund new structures, which sometimes yeah. are questionable in terms of their need. Yeah, we, we, what we what we're looking at with regard to the structures is putting in um, uh, putting in s uh, something like uh, if you if you imagine the bandstand in the in the town um, uh, a gazebo type, but made out of natural materials, so that actually there can be outdoor learning, so that these are for um, uh, being able to have uh, the children learning in that environment, have an outdoor learning area where they can be out of the rain or out of the out of the sun. Um, other structures that are, that are put that add to that, so it, it would be a number of those sort of structures that are put in the outside areas of the school, supporting the biodiverse areas that we're developing, um, uh, and, and redeveloping a, an old pond area that we've got that, that we can then allow uh, nature to take back over, um, uh, and making it accessible for the children to go out there and learn, but also there's a community group that we've engaged with that then want to use the school outside of school hours and use those structures for their own uses as well. So this is not about sort of building a, 
uh, you know, building a new extension to the school that's that then going to be something. This is all about using the outside environment of the school for learning, but also for other activities so that the PTA can hold their summer fairs and use those as, as um, uh, instead of putting up these pop-up gazebos in, in the field, um, community groups can use them, them to have their own community events and we can do um, some um, community facing activities when we have a summer fair or whatever so that we can actually have somebody or the children doing a stall or explaining all these things that they've been doing with the, 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 the money um, and, and signposting that back to the community. I mean, thank you for that sort of detailed explanation. I mean, from the, from the sounds of it, I think you might have something there that would want to support. I just think you need to be very careful about what you're bidding for, because, yeah. you know, so, as I said, you know, just as a word of reservation in round one, we saw um, people applying for relatively large amounts of money for structures, which we then questioned the value of. And if you have a school, then, you know, you will have space that you can use and whether you need to put a roof on that space or put walls on that space. You know, we we would want to see the value of that and why that was yeah, required. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, Lynn Burring, I think you're next. Ah, oh, hello. Yes. Thank you. I have two questions, if uh, if I'm allowed. Um, the first one is, uh, given that um, your preference would be for uh, applications from the north of the uh, of the county. Is there an awful lot of point in uh, those of us in the south actually uh, applying for green shoots funding this time round? Um, Andrew, would you like to take that one again? Happy to. Um, I, I would say yes, but it depends on what your project is. I mean, we we have been very open and honest about you know how much we've spent in terms of funding within the south of the county, within Warwick and Stratford, and to a certain extent rugby. You know, so in our minds, when we look at our per capita spend, we have underfunded Nuneaton and Bedworth and North Warwickshire in particular. And so we do have a preference for placing investment in those areas. And we've been very upfront about that. However, we also want to make sure that all the money we have available is invested. And so if you have a good project, uh, wherever it is within Warwickshire, then we'd, we'd encourage you to apply and, you know, I think Matt said earlier, this is a competitive program, a, a process. If we have lots of really good applications from the areas that we want to fund, then we're more likely to place our investment there. To be quite frank, if we don't have the applications coming forward, we'll have to think about what we're going to do with the money. And if they're good projects that we can fund in other areas, you know, there is a strong possibility we'll want to fund those. So I'd encourage you to apply if you've got a good project that meets our objectives and you want to apply. OK, thank you for that. Uh, the other question is, of course, as you've already said, the uh, these this is a competitive process uh, and you're not the only scheme out there to provide funding for things like uh, climate change related activities i'm thinking of um, there's your there's your own there's green shoots uh, there's the uk share prosperity fund um, and also for tree planting for example there's is branching out um, we have projects which conceivably we could apply to all three and if we wrote really good applications, I suppose it's possible that we would be successful in all three and we might end up with more money than we need. Um, under those circumstances, uh, what would happen? Um, Matt, would you like to take that one? Sure, I mean, I think you'd be very lucky, um, but um, I think we would then encourage dialogue between yourself um, and us. Um, if you perhaps want to apply um, certain levels of grant to different component parts of that project, um, then it, it may be better to do that. Um, but I think you know, let's just have a conversation about that if and when that happens. Uh, yeah, in those ha happy circumstances, but as you say, it's probably unlikely. But uh, yeah, do that. <laughs> OK, thank you. Next, another question for you, Matt, if that's OK. Um, in terms of completion dates of projects, does this have to be by the 31st of March or can it cover a longer period? Yeah, certainly can cover a longer period. Um, we've got some projects from phase one um, that are multi year projects, um, some that are, that are more than two years. Um, so, you know, we quite we understand that this is necessary. Um, you know, there were tree planting projects 
um, with trees being planted every season. Um, I think there's one for three years. Um, so yeah, please send through um, project plans that, that show that. Thank you. And John Hardman, you have your hand up. Yeah, Michael, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Village Hall, which is 100 years old. Um, it's solid wall construction and it's damp um, and, and the heating costs are quite high. We've already engaged a surveyor to um, advise on various improvements in the Village Hall, including insulation. But with the time timeline for applications being September the 19th, would it be possible if we can't obtain um, quotes to actually base an application on pre or, or similar projects that have gone before? Um, Andrew? Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, we're looking to work with, with people pragmatically. The project that you're sort of outlining seems as if it would fit our criteria quite well. Um, we would want the best information that you've got. I mean, I, ideally, you know, I've come back to the point about this being public money and us being, you know, accountable for the, the spend that we, we make. But if you have a, a good estimate of the costs of the project, then we would look to fund you on that basis. Obviously, we wouldn't pay you on the estimates, we would pay you on, on the actual costs that you actually incurred. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be, you know, in, in the example that you're, uh, you're laying out in front of us, I think the, the best way of, of proceeding with that one. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? I should, um, can I just qualify what I just said there? Yes, a second, Because I just, if, listening back to myself, it may be misinterpreted. I think we pay you on the costs incurred up to the value of the application. So, you know, if, if you applied for, I don't know, £10,000 for insulation, and, you know, we thought that's, that sounded reasonable, and we've got experts who, who work in this area, we would, we would fund you to £10,000. But if you then spent £15,000, we would still only look to, to fund the, the 10000 And if that meant that we had to talk about the scope of the project and whether we could afford more or whether you could rein your project in or get funding from other sources, then we would have that conversation at that time. Yep, that, that seems a, a reasonable approach. Thank you. OK, I think that's all the questions. I can't see any others coming in. Oh, we've got one more. Um, do the quotes have to include VAT? Um, Matt, can you answer that, please? Yes, please. Yes, they do. Nice, simple question to finish on, I think. OK, um, Andrew, can I hand back to you to wrap it up, please? Thanks, Rhiannon. Well, um, just to, just to recap, I you know I hope you've heard some really useful information here um, this uh, this evening. I mean, obviously, we're encouraging people to apply for green shoots funding. This is this is funding that we have available. It's been earmarked for this purpose. Um, and as Matt said, you know, there's there's a fair amount of money here. There's you know getting on for a third of a million pounds that we want to invest. So we are encouraging people to apply for this money to use it for the aims and objectives that we've set out in terms of green shoots. If you, I hope the information has been helpful and you're now clear in terms of what we're trying to do and some of the worked examples, uh, I'm sure you've got lots and lots of good ideas, but some of the examples we've given you may, may be food for thought in terms of things that you may want to do locally as well. Um, but I just wanted to sort of like thank you for attending and thank um, everyone for, for coming along, including the, the presenters. And just to recap that we will be sending out a recording of this and also the presentations to all of you. And that will be publicly available information as well, which will be on our website. So if people haven't logged on or, or you know, um, signed up to attend, they can still access the information. So I'd encourage you to, to access the information, but also encourage others to do that uh, as well. And I hope in due course by the 19th of September, that you will uh, uh, submit that green uh, shoots application and in a good quality format so we can evaluate it quickly and uh, and hopefully grant you the money so thank you very much for coming along Rihanna, did i cover everything thank you thank you everyone and thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thanks thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.